Great to see everybody here. Thank you for joining us at this session. We're going to talk shop about location-based virtual reality entertainment. So some of you might be well very familiar with what that means, but some of you might not be so familiar. So before we dive in, I'll play a little video that all of us at HTC's team love. Uh, and it will give you a taste of what it means, location-based VR. around the world. My name is Pearly Chen. I've been with HEC working with the CEO and chairwoman of the company since before we created the Vive brand. Since the very first day, we saw an opportunity to bring the best of humanity with the cutting edge technology to unleash human imagination, passion, and love. Of course, it's about entertainment. It's about bringing those millions of smiles to people. But it's also about bringing a profound impact that will benefit humankind in a way that was not necessarily possible before. And we want to bring this benefit of technology to more people around the world as widely as possible. It's about providing better health care, providing better learning opportunities. It is about democratizing access to amazing, life-changing experiences that were not possible before. And before we see that happen, that's when locations come in to help us create that reach and distribution to more people who are not necessarily ready to buy home a VR system to understand the magic of this technology. That's why we care about being on the front line of engaging customers, engaging brands, engaging all stakeholders in this industry and making sure that we reach those millions of smiles around the world. Today here, we are joined by a fantastic panel of speakers. That We just came from a 90-minute lunch. I, I wish that I had recorded our 90-minute of conversation entirety and just replay it to you here. But I'm sure we'll continue to make the next 60-minute count with all of your participation. So first of all, let me introduce uh, the panel. Uh, in one sentence each, and they'll dive into their very exciting projects. So we have Aaron joining us from Tubis Circus, the, the world's first micro amusement park. We'll hear all about that later. We have Daisy from Exit Reality, an upstart company based in San Francisco, creating beautiful furniture great VR delivery infrastructure to all kinds of business environments. And we have um, Paolo, which, who I just found came from the same hometown as my husband in Italy, uh, from IGT, that is leading charge in the innovation lab of bringing VR into casino floors, doing an amazing experiment right now that he'll tell us more about. And we have Alexis joining us today from Los Angeles who just recently published a report on location-based VR entertainment, working for, uh, at Greenlight, Greenlight Insights. So we, we look forward to hearing some of those objective uh, numbers that can help us put some of these things in perspective. So with, without further ado, a little, little round of intro, then we're diving into a very interesting conversation around several topics, hopefully quite comprehensive, covering all kinds of thoughts and, um, and debates, potentially, and discussions <laughs> around uh, some of the topics facing our industry today. We'll do that for about 30 minutes between us, but I want to make sure we leave 20 minutes for the audience to engage with us in that conversation, questions, thoughts, um, so that we make sure we all have a great time together in this hour that we'll spend together. Without further ado, Erin, 
Hello. That was exciting. I'm excited now. I feel all, all warmed up in this cold room. So I, I am Aaron Polk. I'm head of production and attractions at 2-Bit Circus. We did just open in September the first micro amusement park, which is about 38,000 square feet of entertainment space. We have Carnival Midway games that all have a digital twist. We have a 100-person interactive theater. We have robotic bartender, full food and beverage. Um, and we do have a fair amount of VR in the space, too. We have seated uh, VR. We have with motion-based uh, chairs using D-Box uh, technology. We have um, standing VR experiences. We have free roam uh, experiences. We work with a lot of partners and, um, and bring everybody together elbow to elbow to play is really what we're all about. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daisy from Exit Reality. So as Pearlie said, we build um, furniture grade VR delivery infrastructure. And what that means is we build a VR platform for content such as location-based content or any content at all to go into enterprise or locations that want to use VR for their own use. Um, we're currently heavily focused on FECs and schools and uh, rehabilitation centers, medical centers, and places that are really using VR for enterprise and retail. Um, but we are spread across every vertical, building infrastructure that fits the client's needs, matching it with content. Oh, I have oh you have your own. <laughs> <laughs> I'm my own mic. I'm, I'm Paolo with IGT, been with IGT um, two years now, working on uh, the future of, of gaming in retail casinos and focusing specifically on virtual reality as a really exciting opportunity to bring this immersive type of, of gaming experience into, into that space. We have, we've been working very successfully with Exit Reality. We have a two-player uh, unit where people play competitive virtual reality games and they compete in tournaments and as they compete, um, they, they bring all this excitement in. There's a spectator aspect to it. And, um, and at the end of the day, the winner, the winner takes his prize. And uh, it's a great way for, for people to come into the casinos and, uh, and enjoy a good time in VR. On the screen, we have an illustration of what that looks like for IGT. Yes. Built by Exit Reality, of course. That's true. Yes, that's correct. In conjunction. Yeah. <laughs> yes, with, yes, with. <laughs> in partnership. There we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexis Macklin, and I'm a research manager at Greenlight Insights. So we specifically focus on market intelligence for the VR and AR uh, market and anything immersive related. Uh, so I specifically focus in on media and entertainment. Uh, so I thought I would bring you guys a uh, forecast today to share. Uh, so this is specifically our LBE uh, forecast, that global forecast that we see. And a lot of numbers go into this from uh, our consumer survey. This year we surveyed more than 4,000 uh, US-based consumers. Uh, and we also have a huge uh, location-based tracker with over 700 locations that we track throughout the year for closures, openings, uh, the types of hardware like HTC that they have in it. Um, we have 2-Bit Circus on there as well. Um, so prices within the industry as well. So we see this as a really great opportunity for both uh, developers and other stakeholders in the industry for uh, the out-of-home entertainment market. And of course, uh, at HTC Vive, we've had the fortune of collaborating with some of the most immersive location-based entertainment experiences, like the Mario Kart, the Bondi <laughs> Namco's, the recent Dave & Buster activation that was rolled out to 120 locations across the US in the Jurassic VR experience, as well as many others. But actually, few people know that we also offer a platform called Vipor Arcade that supplies mm -hmm. a uh, secure management software and content licensing platform that helps more independent operators to open business and manage their business and license those commercial content easily. And we're looking forward to, to playing a, a larger role in collaborating with everyone upon, upon what they're building to make this industry a great success. So of course, according to Alexis uh, report, this industry is well on track to be a 12 billion, 10 to 12 billion dollar industry in the next five years. And that is really significant. Some numbers are even showing that 
it'll be VR is a billion dollar industry by this year. I'm not so sure yeah. how yeah. that accurate that is. I mean, some says 200 million. <laughs> hey, hey, we'll debate. We'll debate. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, we'll debate. We're looking we'll for debate. something. Yes, so we'll debate. Yes, we're looking for we'll it debate. for Tracy debate. <laughs> but it's definitely, regardless of the number where it actually falls, it is definitely playing a role in sustaining the near term momentum of the VR industry, where we're seeing consumers' reluctance in buying the whole system home. They they don't mind going to a, a Dave and Buster and pay five dollar per ticket to have an amazing eight minute experience with their friends. So as we were discussing earlier, we all share our sort of checklist on what uh, are the important factors in designing these location-based experiences that should be different from those at-home experiences. Because the interesting uh, data that I shared earlier, which seems to surprise a lot of you, a great majority, let's say 90% of uh, VR owners today are young males versus female. Whereas when you look at locations, you are looking at a much broader set of audience, including 40-50% of female and family members. You're designing for a very different audience, so we should be designing those experiences differently as well. So I want to turn it back to the panel and sort of sharing again that checklist of what makes a great location-based VR experience to the audience. Yeah, definitely some things that are broad appeal are really important. Things that are social are really important to us in, in location-based entertainment because people are going out in groups. They don't want to be isolated. They need to be things that are easy to pick up and play. People need to be able to jump into the experience without having to read a lot of instructions. It needs to be relatively short. There can be longer experiences, but for the most part, they need to be something that people can get into and get out of quickly. And, and they need to be, uh, have some depth to them so that you have some replayability. Those are some of the key in, in ingredients for sure. I, yes, to all of that. Um, something that I would really like to harp upon is something that is really fun to watch people play. Um, a lot of people come to venues or location-based entertainment venues to like watch their kids play or even have their kids watch the parents play. And if you make content that's just standing or not very interactive, it's a lot less fun. So make something that is has a lot of active movement that's really fun to watch and engages the spectator because often or not there's more spectators than there is players. Yes, I would resonate with what Aaron and Daisy were saying. When we started with with this project, we, we defined, we started out by defining what those criteria were for a successful game. Not that we're not learning how well those criteria were defined, but I think we did a pretty good job. And like you said, it's about an, an easy experience to start, an experience that feels deep enough that a repeat a repeat usage or, or playing over and over again could get you better, but never perfect. Uh, a nonviolent experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can we can all agree to that. I know the as we were talking earlier in the panel, uh, we all felt that uh, there are enough shooters, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and so so that that's important. And uh, and I think the competitive spirit of it. That's how. That's that. At least that's our focus when we when we talk about tournaments. We we want to play to the to the nature, the human nature. It's a competitive nature, the nature of play. And, and, and that's a great driver, not just for fun, but also for opportunities to monetize. I think it's important for developers to understand that there's a real opportunity here. It's, 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 there's, there's vast numbers of people that will probably maybe never, or at least not now, are ready to take this home, but I'm more than happy to do it in a location. Uh, I would add from uh, what we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of locations focus in on action and first person shooters, which isn't much of a shocker uh, since looking at the market of what we have now. But when we see interest from actual consumers, we're seeing a lot of different interest in uh, very much the essence of escapism. So traveling to a new place, uh, seeing something that's very immersive. Um, gaming in our surveys usually hit about middle of the pack for the general consumer and what they want to do, something more traveling or uh, interactive um, rather than necessarily focusing on that traditional gaming background. So we're definitely, there's a lot of room for diversity of content. One more thing that I would like to add um, that 
uh, I, we've learned from our research as well that for FECs specifically, 70% of the audience is younger than the age of 11. That's Family Entertainment Centers. Family mm -hmm. Entertainment Centers. So Family Entertainment Centers is Dave and Buster's, um, bouncy houses, trampoline parks, anything like that. So family-friendly content that is, again, nonviolent, but mm -hmm. also really beautiful and interactive and expansive for its children to like ex have that escapism yeah. but family friendly is really important and that will again have the parents be accepting of the technology to have their kids play it so I think all of the above plugs sort of compels me to represent Jason here, Jason Crawford from <laughs> Moto VR, our friend that was supposed to join us today on this panel, but is actually at Two Bit Circus fixing, uh, not fixing, completing a uh, installation for tonight's opening. So, so, uh, so what Jason is trying to do with the creator Chuck E. Cheese and Atari uh, is this it hits all the the points of, of no learning curve. Anyone can jump in and have a great time competitive, it's multiplayer, it's super family-friendly type of content. Uh, that's what they're trying to do, put into Tupac Circus, as well as in Caesars, and many more family entertainment locations. We at HCC love this game. We, you, it really showcases the six degrees of freedom tracking of our Vive Focus has said. Uh, no controllers needed. Anybody can have a great time. So, so that was a, a quick summary of what the panelists have put together and what makes successful location-based entertainment experiences. Any surprises there? Any refutes, debates from the audience? Anything we're not covering? Anyone to share more checklist? I did want to emphasize again about in terms of like violent content. We see the numbers can be misleading right now because you look at what some of the most popular titles in arcade are and they tend to be uh, some violent titles, shooters and things like that. But it's because that's what's out there, and there's there's a lot of that content. If you look at the home market, where it is 90% male, yeah. um, you get a lot more of these kind of aggro games. Uh, but when you go into the out of home um, market, it's it's much more balanced. You have a lot of kids, um, you have a lot of uh, families going out together, you have a lot of just people hanging out with their friends that are that are looking for a wide variety of content, whether they're male or female. They're not all looking for shooters. They're looking for all kinds of exploratory things. They're looking for puzzle solving. They're looking for creative outlets. And they're looking for this escapism. Um, it doesn't all have to be about shooters. And so it's not always safe to just follow the data of what's popular and say, I guess I should make more of that. Right. Sometimes it's good to look at what isn't there and know that in other platforms, we're seeing all kinds of games. And so we shouldn't be isolating ourselves to just whatever is hot at the moment. Absolutely. I like to add to that that there's something special about virtual reality and its presence. You are in the world. You feel like you're there. You're part of it. Being violent in a world where you are there with yourself, with your own body, is different than doing it on a screen or on a cell phone. It impacts your psyche, I think, in ways that we don't really even, we can't even predict. I mean, we've seen, you know, there's a lot of violence in our world. We saw what happened two days ago. And, and I think, you know, it's, we, we need to be careful with this technology. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and we were just actually also talking about the importance of marketing. Uh, experiences versus the technology. VR today is still quite a novel concept. Maybe not for those of us in the room here, but if you walk out on the street, 95% of people probably don't really know what VR is or don't really have a reason to care about it yet. So as we're trying to figure out how to bring this concept and experience to more people, it's important, as Aaron was telling us, to say, come and do this amazing experience with your friends versus come and try VR. Right, and there's a number of different ways to bring VR to the masses through different locations, through different type of installations that X Reality is helping to enable. Um, there are all there are these kind of karaoke type rooms where you rent by time and a bunch of friends um, play, rotate and playing single player experiences. But there are also more bespoke attractions that takes bespoke props or like hyper reality experiences, etc. There's so many different modalities. So I'd like to hear from the panel here on what they observe have been working well and what have not been working so well in identifying what are some of the opportunities that developers and, and, and the commercial interest should be thinking about investing. 
Yeah, there are a lot of different kinds of experiences that we, we can do, and, and, and in many cases we do. Um, and it's, uh, we do have the Vive Focus headsets in modal, and we've got a lot of uh, Vive and Vive Pro headsets, but we don't promote that this is a place to come and put a headset on. Mm -hmm. We promote that it's a place to come and have an adventure. And so, like, we have story rooms that include a real physical escape room. Um, maybe we can turn the volume off on that. I'd love to see that, but yeah, without yeah. blasting the, uh, yeah, the room. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. uh, but, yeah, that's... Um, uh, the raft is an experience that's uh, built by Starbreeze and Red Entertainment that we themed out a room for it. So you you go into the uh, uh, the raft room and you're transported already into the bayou. So it, we've themed it out like a, a theme park pre-show uh, kind of space that helps you get into the right mindset before you even put on the headset or backpack. And it's promoted as this raft adventure. Um, it's not promoted as I'm going to put on a VR headset. And I think that helps a lot of people that would otherwise be intimidated by VR to just know we're going to go and do this fun thing. And then they go in and find themselves pulled into the experience. It's, it's more um, uh, immersive overall that way from the moment they walk in the door. Yeah, um, the way that we approach this from an infrastructure standpoint is when you, for example, when we're looking down here <laughs> at all these cables and the computers and any person, if they tried long enough, they could probably figure out how to use it, but it looks a little bit inaccessible for the everyday user. So when you have a headset and the tripods and the cables and the, and the cabling and the projection, and the ma it looks inaccessible and hard to understand. It's kind of a hard pill to swallow. And then people tell you, yeah, but it's amazing and you're going to leave reality and it's the mo amazing, most amazing experience of your life. Yes, that will happen when you put the headset on. But how can you have that moment of interaction with it before you have the headset on where you actually feel like this is something that I, I can do and I can interact with? And so we've done that by hiding all the cables. We've done that by having a simple one power on button, by having a beautiful clean screen for the spectators to watch. There's all these little details that make VR more approachable for the everyday user that really come around the in, in the infrastructure way. You still get a lot of people watching before they, they're willing to jump in. Though. We, we saw that a lot at, at, uh, at the first casino installation that we had. We had this the, the surfing man, surfing the surfing attraction, attraction feeling where there's two or three people that are brave enough to jump in and put the headset and the rest are sort of mingling around and watching. And that, and then usually by the time these people come out, they're, they're, their face is brimming, they're so happy because they, they, they really experience something unique and, and, and valuable. And so that sort of encourages more people to come in. But certainly the, the idea of having this great spectator experience and with the integration of, of Live, which, which Reality is doing now with their, with their stations and we'll, we'll bring to ours, uh, I think it's going to be amazing because then what you'll be able to see is you'll be able to see your friend that's playing the game, but it's also in the world. So it's a mixed reality experience that really draws people people in. I don't know if you guys have done any any research on on mixed reality, but uh, yeah, um, we we don't have anything specific in terms of uh, mixed reality helping or hurting an installation. It's still pretty early yet, but one thing that we always see is that social that social multiplayer um, that connection is very important. So something that we see from um, both a LVE side and also on a consumer side is that uh, the consumers are very interested in social experiences and multiplayer. They are more uh, interested in interacting with people that they know rather than uh, strangers, and I think that's inherently human. Um, but uh, there's a lot of potential there. That's something that they do want. They do want to interact with people just like we're interacting right now. Um, and being able to talk and play games with people that they know, feeling that connection, that's really cool. And we've already seen really great responses on social media, especially with Beat Saber for, for mixed reality, that viralness of it. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of potential with mixed reality, and that's really, really exciting. And we were talking earlier about how important it is just to look cool while you're in, in VR, because often it doesn't look cool. And so the more the experience itself can actually lend towards that, and Beat Saber is a great example, because you actually look pretty amazing while you're doing that. And it's fun to do, it's visceral, all those things um, help to make it a more fun experience for the person, but it's super fun to watch. And there's, there's a lot of experiences that are fun to watch. 
Um, when they aren't, um, there are things that we can do with lighting and other things like that to help people look a little bit more awesome. Um, but the more that that experience can be built from the ground up to have people performing actions that, that aren't physically painful, <laughs> but that are um, entertaining to watch and as part of that experience is, is super helpful. In case, in yeah. case mixed reality uh, sorry, is a lingo that some of you are not familiar with, it's an easy way to tell the story of what's going on in VR instead of just filming a person in a headset plus a small screen on the side, is putting that person in that virtual world. And these B-Saber mixed reality uh, videos have garnered half a billion views uh, since the launch in, in early May. So it really proves to that human nature and virality of watching others do something that you're feeling quite intimidated to, to do and not quite ready to jump in yet. That's the surface attraction we were talking about earlier. People love to watch. So the, the, coming back to that question of what, what has worked well, it sounds like it's removing that intimidation, it's making sure people come together, it's making sure these experiences are amazing to watch. I love that Daisy talked about how X Reality has an installation in the hotel and in downtown San Francisco by the lobby with a glass window and it's free to play and people literally walk by and wonder what that is and walk into the hotel and start ordering drink and sitting there and lounging and watching people play VR. That's <laughs> become a new revenue stream as well. So there's, these are interesting things that we're, we're learning in the beginning of this industry and that, that's fascinating. And there are multiple reasons that's important too because the throughput is relatively low of VR compared to other attractions that you could put in a theme park, for example. And so it is important that everybody else gets to, to cooperate and, and be a part of that. And sometimes that's just watching and that can be awesome. I think there needs to be more experiences that actually allow the audience to participate. Um, there are games like Keep Talking Nobody Explodes that you can play at home that, that have that, that connection between the people in VR and the people outside. But more of that in out of home would be awesome. Awesome. We'd love to see more. I was going to comment that this aspect of watching and how fun it is to watch actually bodes well for a future in which big virtual reality sports event might become a thing that we, we, we become accustomed to. Instead of going watching a football game, we could go and watch a virtual reality arena in which there's, a, there's 20 players playing on, on Mars and we could all be participating in that. And potentially, and that would be interesting for a company like, like ourselves, would be to potentially open that up to a true sport betting um, uh, you know, opportunity. And, so and, spe yeah. spectating, yeah. betting, participating, the social, uh, the social element really coming together in a, in a truly, and not, not just interesting, but monetized, but revenue interesting way. And maybe for the first time in history, esports athletes can be actual athletes performing acts that would justify them to be on the Olympics, being very physically fit, attractive to watch. When the, the, the stadium arena size of audience is no longer watching people using mouse and keyboards and clicks and that, but instead performing amazing, incredible acts that will be amazing entertainment for, for the masses. So that's something we look forward to seeing. Yeah, something that I will add of these themes that we're talking about, uh, of one example that I thought of is Kite and Lightning's uh, Babylon of this kind of uh, social ex experience of a uh, baby battle bot um, fighting against each other in a, a stadium and then if you're watching it you can interact by throwing in items that help or hurt the competitors um, but, so that's really interesting but it's this whole idea that you're trying to gain fame within that too so it's very interesting but thinking creatively about how you can get that audience involved is uh, really cool to, to think about and something that's uh, becoming a new concept. Um, when I went to IAPA, I introduced myself to every single project manager or designer of theme parks that I could possibly find. It would take the time to sit down with me. Um, and I asked them to look around and to tell me what they thought about all the VR attractions. And they said that the attractions were too focused on the single player use. They're too focused on the content that is happening with that one person. And they're forgetting about the 100 or the 150 people that are too scared to try, yeah. that are watching. Um, so once VR becomes an attraction for the hundred people that are watching, it's going to implode and explode. Sorry, not implode. <laughs> it's going to explode. <laughs> Very different. Um, it's going to explode in that theme park, in that world where you can just have four or five people go at once and a hundred people can be watching. Um, so it's really, really important to make something that like we said, it's fun to watch. And as a spectacle, they really loved that word. It has to be a spectacle. 
A lot of times, the business model is, is important uh, to to make this um, a financially viable uh, operation. So, I'd like to maybe turn the discussion towards that in terms of what type of ROI matrix are operators looking at to justify investing in in VR to bring these amazing new experiences to people? Uh, are some of the more dedicated VR arcades uh, able to sustain that that financial model, or is it necessary to include food and beverage and and other sorts of revenue? And where is this all going? Yeah, so for all of LBE, the, there's a dollar per square foot yes. equation that needs to be uh, lived with. <laughs> that it's, it's, uh, it's really cool. People want to make these giant free roam experiences, and those can be amazing, but they take a lot of space for very few people, and they tend not to be great for spectating. And so that's, uh, that's a really challenging one to, to make work. And so making good use of space, I see a lot of experiences that are actually wasting a lot of space. They have dead space between people because they are mapping one to one what's happening in VR and what's happening physically, even though they don't need to. And it's wasting uh, physical real estate, which is is a super premium in any kind of LBE. You could put another attraction there. You could put food and beverage there. You could put a, a lot of things in that space. And so every square foot counts. Um, the the durability of the technology matters. Uh, how easy it is to put on on and off the whole throughput. Uh, concept is is really important being able to get people moving through the experience with minimal uh, dead time between and then also having uh, how many staff members are required sometimes you need somebody gearing people up and somebody else running the experience and somebody else doing something else that's too many um, it should be something that ideally it would require no operators just like an arcade game you could just walk up and play usually there's an operator required there somewhere but you want to minimize that and make sure that it it, it doesn't require a lot. Those are some of the, the yeah. key metrics for sure. Right. There's also really clever ways, again, I'm gonna pull mixed reality into it, to like monetize the experience post experience. Um, so we're working directly with Liv on creating like little clips that people can take home and share in social media, and then the location can then make revenue off of that as well. And then branding space and being able to like m give their booths up for like karaoke hours, bundling birthday bundles, bundling it with other attractions, um, but really learning how to monetize it correctly. From our perspective, monetization is obviously very important. In fact, it's probably the reason why we're still experimenting in, with yeah. this and we, we are not selling hundreds of units into our market. Um, the, the, the casinos that are interested are seeing this in different ways. Um, it, it's certainly attracting the type of customers that they want to attract because they, they, it's a different type of appeal. From surveys we ran, almost 50% of the, of the people that came out to play at Virtual Zone had never been in a casino. So it's an opportunity to bring people in that would not come at all. For, for, for example. And, and of course, we, we, we thought a lot about optimizing the space. Like you said, there's amazing large scale warehouse scale, they call them warehouse scale experiences, but multiply the number of square feet by the average coin in of uh, a slot machine and you have a number that you, you can't even wrap your head around. So, especially when you have conversations with casino executives. So uh, we're, we're still experimenting. We're trying to figure this out. I think there's there's big 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 future for this in, in casinos, uh, but um, there's still a lot of work ahead to figure it out. Yes. I think I admitted to mention that IGT, of course, a global market leader in supplying slot machines, casino technology, entertainment to casinos around the world. And it's so interesting to me that leaders like themselves in that vertical is experimenting with bringing VR and with the financial lens on it and how to make that an RI positive operation. We're still experimenting, yes, but we're we love looking promising so far. We create great experiences. We have 40 machines that that create that 3D effect without glasses, but uh, we're always looking at technology to make it uh, more interesting for our, for our players. Uh, something that I will add from uh, 
data that we've been seeing from our location-based tracker. Uh, so we're actually seeing a uh, average ticket price of about uh, 50 to 60 cents per minute, which is lower than the kind of off-sided dollar per minute standard, um, which is when you look at is that some- willingness to pay? What is it? Oh, no, the, that's uh, what location-based uh, operators are actually charging. So when you think about these uh, arcades, these VR arcades, they're charging between 30 to 40 dollars yep. for an hour mm -hmm. um, and that can still be a lot for say a family of four who just went to a movie theater right. and then are thinking about spending an hour to to play vr so that's you know can be costly for for a family um, but when you're thinking about something like uh the uh the uh jurassic world experience at dave and buster's that's five dollars for five minutes that's a much more uh uh, accessible experience because that's an incremental charge just like we've seen with mobile games. Um, so the th throughput is super uh, important of getting quick experiences, getting people through, and that way you can have uh, a bigger revenue per hour than maybe possibly before. Um, whereas those uh, hour-long experiences uh, are going to take some time to turn over to. And we saw this um, uh, back in the 90s, the, the first time LBE VR was, was cool, that um, there, there was the novelty effect kicks in and people are willing to pay anything uh, to do something they've never seen before once. Um, but if you want them to come back again, it's, it's got to even out to a price that makes sense. And when we look at a dollar per minute kind of uh, uh, metric, People are comparing it to other experiences they could do, not necessarily other experiences of the same caliber. And so initially, we all look at it and go, well, this is way cooler than a movie, so of course we should charge way more than a movie. But when a family is deciding what to do with their evening, they're looking at, well, I could go to a movie and it's going to cost this much and with popcorn and dinner and all that, or I could go do these VR experiences and they'll cost this much. And so over time, that, that we have to be careful to not fool ourselves into thinking that you can charge exorbitant uh, fees. But at the same time, it is expensive and it is a different experience. It is more immersive. It is uh, more one-on-one -on -one or, or four-on-four or whatever um, the size of the experience it is. And so there's, there's practical realities of what we need to charge to make it make sense, but we have to balance that against the, the realities of what people are willing to pay. I think replayability is so important, a factor that contributes to that financial viability of these operations. Uh, of course, we have hyper-reality experiences like the voice, zero latency that costs $35, $55, etc. but with very little replay value. And those operations need to be somewhere with extremely high traffic and counting only on sort of one-time patronage, basically. Yeah. They're not counting on any replays. But for other more independent or smaller scale or family entertainment centers type of operators, that replayability is so key. What we're learning with Viveland, which we've opened to in Taiwan, uh, in learning about how this operation works, is running tournaments, is a great trick in getting people engaged. They come back and practice in hopes of winning some grand prizes. That, that we've seen in the past summer with the V-Saver tournament as well, and there's more tournaments coming up. And sort of these centers become a community center where people come together and enjoy that kind of gameplay, brushing up their skills uh, against one another or somewhere across the world. Um, so, so that's interesting. But also in finding alternative business models in, say, after-school programs or corporate events buyouts, which Tuba Circus, of course, is doing some as well. So let's now talk about more of these sort of alternative models and sustaining that replayability and uh, flexibility of location usage. Yeah, I would definitely say for developers getting into building things for LBE, they should be focusing on that replayability. To build something that's big and epic and charges that premium price costs a lot of money yes. and requires distribution and, like you said, in areas that have high tourist traffic, which of course are very expensive real estate. Right. And so it's, it's not an entry level place to go. But you can't, anybody can create a really compelling experience that's fun to watch, it's fun to re repeat. Um, Having things in it that, again, if it's not about shooting, if it can be more collaborative where people are working together, those things start to make sense for these corporate events and team building exercises and school uh, programs, things that parents would be happy that their kids are doing or employers would be happy that their employers are doing together as opposed to doing something that's just pure visceral fun. That opens up a lot more um, opportunities for, for these kind of corporate buyouts, for, for school programs during the day, things, um, more revenue streams for everybody. 
There is um, a title that comes to mind that I really, there's a couple of things that it hits that is to me the, the highest level of replayability. Um, for example, there's this game called, I'm gonna say it wrong because it has a Russian name, but I think Kikiroki. Um, and the way that it works is you come in and you can choose a different avatar and the avatar that you choose depends on what style game you have. But the game style is the exact same mechanic as the other avatars, but the environments are different and your specific little language of what you're doing is different. So it's the kind of the whack-a-mole, but then it's all the way around. So many different types of levels, even though it's the exact same mechanics, and then many different types of avatars, many different types of environments, and then all also, it's very fun to watch. It's active, and you're turning around and around and around. And then, again, on top of that, it has a tournament mode where you can see your mom, and then you can see your dad over there, and you can see your sister, and you can see them all in their little characters. So it has that tournament mode and that competitive feeling. And at the end, there's a leaderboard. So it has hits all the points, family-friendly, tournament mode, it, like many different levels, replayability, and then it's also beautiful. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can just be beautiful. That's all. I, I don't have much to add to that. I think uh, one of the things that we, we felt was really important is that the experience was significant in a short amount of time. Our, the games we play in Virtual Zone actually only take two minutes of real play time. There's about a minute or so of training depending on how familiar you are with the game or not. That short time is really, people, nobody's really complained about the price when the, the, that short time is really well, well defined and well, well, uh, well spent. The, it's, it's really all about developers. This is a developer conference. I really encourage you to, to think about simpler experiences yeah. like that. There's a great opportunity in locations and don't have to make it complicated. You don't have to spend millions of dollars building these crazy worlds. I mean, you can if you want to, but there's, an, there's a vast opportunity in doing something simple that is just fun um, at a visceral level. And you've observed a high degree of replayability when there is a prize involved, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Tell me about uh, that story. Absolutely, people absolutely. Night night. People come back night after night because they, they really enjoy the competition. They get to know each other. We, we got to know some of the players that, that, that came and played frequently at, uh, at the casino installation we did this summer. And they really just became advocates. They brought their friends. It was, it was really fun to, to just observe that at a human level, uh, the impact of that, uh, of, of having an experience like that. And nobody's talked about um, a slot machine to me like that um, <laughs> ever, but, you know, I don't know. So... <laughs> I don't have too much to add for replayability, but I was trying to think about it on the other side of, I'm, if you're a developer that really wants to create this epic story, um, whether that's on the entertainment side or gaming, and it kind of has to be something that you want to bring your friends to, which is really hard and rare to, to think about when you think about a movie that um, you want to see over and over again or a ride that you want to go over and over again. It has to have profound impact, which is tough to do. Um, so so it's not unachievable, but it's definitely tough. Um, like something like uh, the the voids, uh, different installations, especially the Star Wars one. Um, you play through it once, but maybe you go again to show someone else, um, and that can be expensive. So that's something to to consider too, of looking for that uh, wow factor, I guess, or that uh, relatability with the with the famous IP of uh, bringing someone in, with, whether that's uh, Mario Kart or uh, Harry Potter or Star Wars, anything Disney, I guess, with Marvel too and DC. So that's harder to accomplish, right. but it's still doable. And when we think about location locations, we're not limiting to just arcades or family entertainment centers or a couple of places that we've mentioned as in the public or out of home VR experiences. They're also popping up in places like cruises with our partner Carnival cruises. There are a lot more cruises coming out to introduce VR to their audience, uh, but also in airports and in many other locations, hotels we mentioned. So um, this the following question is about adapting your solutions and your game design to different contexts and locations and different audiences. 
Daisy talk extensively oh. about that. Okay. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, so because we build VR infrastructure, it, we can apply that to any single vertical that wants to use VR. And surprise, surprise, every single vertical is about, I think, 92% of verticals are looking to adapt VR into their everyday use, mm. which is huge. So if we're talking to, let's say, a hotel or a resort, they might want something very different than a, an FEC or a bouncy house. And let's say now we're talking to a rehabilitation center that's all about meditation and finding a cl calm and zen space and a safe space. And then from the next day, we're talking to Harvard and they want to use VR as to like a presentation and to teach their students how to develop in VR while they're all wearing headsets. And so there is many different variants and every single one has a specific requirement. And so what Exit Reality does is we do a three month workshop exercise for every single vertical that we are initiated into and then we actually pull developers and hardware partners alike into that vertical with us. We're an integrator and we present them to the clients. So we really are here to like boost the developers and we're also here to like offer any insight to developers as to what clients are looking for. Anything to add? <laughs> I was going to say there are, of course, bespoke installations yeah. for other yeah. things. We've done things in the past for the NFL, for the, for a Super Bowl, and for the Olympics, where you have just a lot of people that have never touched VR coming through uh, a, a space, and that's that's it is a very different kind of thing to build that, but it's it still comes down to it, it being approachable, and all of the, a lot of the same uh, things apply. Mm -hmm. Um, I just thought of something to add. Uh, something to consider too is that, especially if you're uh, looking at a location-based uh, venue that has a lot of different uh, people coming in, you want to try to make it accessible to a lot of different people, especially with languages. Uh, so something like uh, the, the Void Star Wars experience, you interact with characters in English, and that can be a bit frustrating when you have different uh, consumers that are coming who don't speak English. And that's not just for that specific user but for other people as well and I know uh, Daisy you were talking about one I think it was the the Russian uh, title that didn't really have language it was kind of easy to jump into mm -hmm. there's, al there's also the the thought of um, accessibility for people in wheelchairs or for people with um, autism or for people with a specific the, the hearing aids or visual or epilepsy. So then these kinds of people are everyday people that might be using or interacting with the content that you make if it's location and out of home, location based. Um, so there was a really interesting program that we did with Star Wars with the ILM XLab Studios and Nissan and they wanted to make content that was able to reach the entire US market and we did a road show with them and we did about 6,000 demos in three months and their content was 100% accessible. So it was tested and tried with doctors that people in wheelchairs could play it. People didn't have to use, there was no speaking. You didn't have to use verbal commands. There was no, you, if you couldn't move around, there was a specific setting for that and the content would relay that back to the user. So awesome. important. Yeah. So we, we have some uh, Team HTC members here, so it's a good time for us to throw out our wish list for future hardware. What are some of your desired features uh, in hardware peripherals, software or hardware products that you wish to have vibe with or, or the industry stakeholders would be building to make this continued success? Definitely having things be easy to clean is super important. Um, that's uh, something people are very concerned about when they come into an out-of-home uh, thing. No matter what it is, they, they're concerned about hygiene, but putting something on your face is especially sensitive. Um, and if you look at like 3D glasses at theme parks, those go into dishwashers. Um, we can't do that with a, with a uh, VR headset. And so being able to take components of it off to do that would be great. Um, also making them really robust. People are really abusive um, in out-of-home to the, the hardware where they take headsets and swing them around. They do all the things that you would tell people, don't ever do that. And of course, our, our staff will try to stop that, but it, but it can happen quickly. People can drop a headset. So um, just making things really rugged is, is definitely important. And it has to be lightweight. It's, it's all of the things, the competing things that, we, um, that don't all fit into one headset. That's what we want. We want it easy to clean, to fit over glasses, be super lightweight, super rugged, last forever, and look great. 
A big thing that I've also easy. (laughs) Big thing that I've also heard um, because I'm also part of the VR arcade owners group is um, they're having a lot of issues with fitting the headset over if somebody's wearing a headpiece or if they have thicker hair or if they don't want their like I wear my hair in a bun. What if I don't want to take it off? And then also just the weight of the headset sometimes puts pressure on people's noses and they feel uncomfortable. So if you could make it less heavy, that would be nice. (laughs) <laughs> I think from a, from an e- a virtual reality esports perspective, which is sort of our north star, um, it would be nice to see you know full body full body capabilities coming mm-hmm. in ways that are easy to manage at a at a location, you know, in and out. Because I think the idea of being in there with your entire body, including your feet, would just open up to some some seriously ex- um, exciting. Uh, you know, sports, you know, virtual sports. Yeah. Um, I don't have too much to add. I think you guys covered it great, especially from a research uh, perspective. Um, I think the only thing is that uh, we've seen a lot of hope with standalones, especially when thinking about the global market, since, uh, you know, the uh, European household don't have the, the living room space that maybe an American will. Um, so that's that's really cool to, to think about that impact that um, standalone will have going forward. One last thing, because... 70% of family entertainment attendees, family t- center attendees are below 11, uh, years below 11 years old. We would love to have smaller child size headsets. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, taking notes. Okay, so on, on, on that cue of standalone, how do you see standalone headsets um, will change the landscape of location based VR? Well, I think it's awesome to be able to have inside-out tracking, first of all, whether it's, it's standalone or not. That's mm-hmm. uh, helped us a lot. We have a lot of IR to mitigate in our, right. our space, so um, it's, it's nice having that. It is nice to have something that's, that's lightweight and, and portable. It's a little bit easier to deal with, with uh, not having to worry about cable management. Um, cables do break. That's one of the things that, that fails frequently, and so having uh, removing that is, is huge. Um, I think it is... Um, it's okay for, for a lot of experiences don't need the same fidelity that you get in a, in a full um, regular headset connected to a PC, but it does, we do have to be choiceful about what experiences really make sense on, on lower powered uh, uh, computing platforms. So it's, a, it's an exciting thing. I'm glad to see it coming. We're, we're launching modal tonight with the Vive Focus. Um, so we're really excited to see, see how that goes. Yeah, we're really excited about it as well, actually. And I, because we are, again, <laughs> infrastructure, um, it's going to be really exciting to see how, from my point of view, you, when you want to play VR, you want to be aware that you're departing reality. So we don't want to just have a blank space where now you, there's a headset sitting on a table and that's what you put on. How do we change the environment to include the aspect of this opening door to a new reality how what can we do to the room to actually integrate the room in and and express the experience from the outside in so we're really excited about the the potential because now instead of just building units we can rebuild physical infrastructure to match experiences that people will be experiencing in their own i add to that too Um, I, I see it, too, as a, as a gateway towards augmented reality and mixed reality uh, platforms. And so being, having that mobile, being able to see through it, we were talking earlier about how important it is to be able to see people's faces and, and body language, and, and you get that stuff for free when you're in AR. And so as the more that we can ad- adapt um, these kinds of technologies and expand it towards in that direction, I think we're, we're going to... Yeah, it's going to include a lot more people. It's a lot more approachable, and it allows you to take that environment, especially in out of home, where we know where everything is, and and it's a it's a, a, a carefully orchestrated lighting conditions and all that. We have a better chance of of making that work well, and so I'm really excited about that in the long run. I'll add that, um, you know, another thing that we were talking about as a group was this idea that developers would be able to more easily uh, fit for both in-home and out-of-home, but something that is more immersive, uh, like a six-off experience, which is really important because distribution, both from if you're looking to just distribute as far and wide as possible, um, reaching that out-of-home market as quickly as possible will will be really important for game developers. 
That's why we just announced on the stage yesterday <laughs> that six of Wave uh, controllers for Vibe Wave supported standalone devices. So definitely six of brings that extra immersion. We're super excited about the, the new category and how that will change the landscape, not just in location, but for consumers and business use and broad range um, of applications. So final question I'm going to pose on my panelists before opening up for questions. Get those questions ready. Um, it's a little bit more philosophical. So I think we're all very well aware of a very dystopian view of what this might mean, a future where everyone lives in the stacks and in perpetual simulations and only in VR without finding a reason to interact in real life anymore, like the, the movie Ready Player One will depict. So how do we sort of think about moving from very human-centered design and, and satisfying a lot of these addictive kind of entertainment to a more human protective design, how do we move from the human-machine interaction to a more society technology interaction? Could there be some unintended consequences as we design this new reality, as we hold all hold responsibilities in this early transformative defining stage? So how do we think about all that and what, how do we make sure that we work together and ensure the, the future is better and not worse off because of this new reality? That is super important. And that, that's part of why we're building these, these micro amusement parks, to bring people physically together to play. And it's, it's about having those, those social interactions. So even if it is VR that you're going into, you're going into it with other people, you're spectating, you're, you're participating in that. And they are short session experiences. You're not, gonna, you're not going into your basement for, for the next 40 hours alone, um, getting, getting Uber Eats delivered or something. You're, <laughs> you're, you're there with friends. You're interacting with other people. You're dipping into these experiences together and then dipping back or coming back out to the to reality interacting talking about your experience and then dipping into something else and I think that that's really location-based entertainment has a real opportunity to continue to foster that kind of healthy uh, kind of immersion where where you are doing it with other people physically and yeah. and still maintaining that human connection and keeping fit as well yeah. <laughs> keep it fit, sure. um, there is something weird that happens when people go into VR in social VR experiences and even video games in general where they seem to think that they have a mask on and can behave in a way that is inappropriate. Um, so I think that for virtual reality to become so mainstream that we spend a good amount of time in, in, in it every single day that we need to learn to behave in the way that we would behave in regular circumstances in, in a virtual environment as well. Um, one negative interaction in VR can lead you to not want to try that again and it's ruined some titles for me. So I think that governing or some kind of rules of law inside of behavioral VR experiences is really important even though um, it hasn't been applied just yet. Yeah. Well, we we haven't been at it long enough, yeah. really. I mean, everybody is just a hack right now. Um, <laughs> you know, when when our kids will grow up, or kids maybe not, but but maybe our nephews will grow up, understanding <laughs> VR as a natural way to to be and to interact. Some of that will be will be will be settled. I imagine. I can't imagine we're having VR prisons or VR, you know, <laughs> justice systems or international court of the VR, but uh, I think just under learning uh, how, to, how to behave in that and, you know, do we spend more time with each other now that we have more technology? Maybe not, but what's, what, what two bit is doing is, is, is amazing and I think VR could be a great way to attract people around something exciting to, to share. Yeah. So. Uh, something I'll add on uh, a hopeful standpoint of what we're seeing about uh, interest from consumers right now is that uh, it's kind of going back to what I was talking about at the very beginning where they're interested in you know, seeing the world, seeing different um, educational purposes, uh, using it for productivity to help with their real lives um, and also interacting with those that they know. So it's more about using VR as a platform at, and a tool than that kind of uh, world of no consequences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's definitely that responsibility with all of us to decide what is a safe spot, what is over the line, and uh, creating diversity of content to where it can bring you back to the real world a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and final thought before I open the floor is how we all strongly agree that we're still so early 
in this industry, there's so much room for all the players to succeed. So there's really a strong desire that we should all collaborate and work together because together we can do a lot of great things and the rising tide will lift all boats. So instead of competition, let's think about collaboration, how we can all work, to work together. Like a lot of high profile projects so far have been the great collaboration of multiple parties coming together, right? For example, the IG Virtual team, Zone is a collaboration right? of at least two, three different companies. So there's I'm very proud of that. There's uh, IGT, there's HTC, there's Six Sense, right? And uh, Dave and Buster activation was a, was a labor of love from a lot of multiple stakeholders coming together as well. So we strongly believe as a panel, as a group, that together we'll be stronger, we'll be better together. So with that, I'll open the floor and welcome any questions, uh, even the controversial, even some uh, something debatable. We haven't really quite found something we disagree on <laughs> quite yet. Um, but, but yeah, hopefully, um, questions. Thank you. I don't think this is controversial, but I'm curious to uh, pa uh, panel to panel, since you all have a lot of uh, experience. Uh, you talked about different hair, which I agree, you know, natural hair can be really kinky and like you just can't get the HMD on. I was curious about how much uh, feedback you've been getting on, uh, on no shape, because that differs quite a bit around the world. And I know I've given, you know, with Follow the White Rabbit, I've been given thousands and thousands of demos. And, uh, you know, some of the, you know, the, the, the different shapes right here can be quite challenging to keep the headsets on. Yeah. How do you, have you guys uh, found that? Any, anything? Um, oh, no, I just totally know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> not for myself, but yes. for other people, just the, that whole, uh, the whole from the headset to the nose, it gets heavy, it totally breaks your immersion. So well, the, uh, yeah, basically in Asia, Asian, you know, faces tend to have a very different shaped nose here mm -hmm. as well as, you know, people from, um, uh, you know, um, you know, black Americans especially too. It's just a different shape and it doesn't, it doesn't, it'll like, it like just keeps creeping down the face. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad HTC is here listening. That's um, because it, it is a challenge in terms of like the number of adjustments we have, the newer um, a headset that only has a single dial on the back that for the most part that's all you need to use to adjust on the head is great but it doesn't do anything to adjust on the nose and, and around eyeglasses is a, is a problem unless people have very tight eyeglasses it, it can be difficult to fit over so that yeah it, it is a challenge to deal with the, the wide range of, of sizes of heads from, from children to, to adults and the different face shapes. We're definitely doing a lot of ergonomic studies and for industrial design purposes, studying all sort of faces and shapes and try to find the common denominators <coughs> as, to the best we can. Uh, there are also different sort of adaptive uh, accessories to, to adjust the size, but it is a challenge that will hopefully become a lot lesser when headsets become lighter, form factor become a, a lot more palpable for most of the population, and we're ho hopefully moving towards the right direction. I have an actually an interesting personal experience. Um, I recently tried Ballast VR. They made an underwater VR headset um, where you can go underwater, you're wearing a snorkel, and you are trying VR underwater. It's a little shocking. Um, <laughs> it's, it's quite intense because um, you... It's a, it's, it's, it was for me, but other people loved it. Um, but I didn't know which way it was up or down, and you're underwater, so you can't really breathe. Um, but what they did with the headset, which was really interesting with the nose, is they actually made it cover the nose completely as a snorkel headset would. And two things happened. One, I was more immersed because I didn't have that pressure. And two, whenever I breathed in, it would suck really close into my face. So it wasn't a perfect thing, but maybe something that covers the nose yeah, yeah. would be a good solution. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was a completely different style of headset, and it, it did help, actually, with the pressure right there on the nose. Next question? Oh, well, sorry. yeah. No. Developers in general, and small developers in particular, have to think about time. So if we're considering whether to go after LBE for, for a game, it seems like there's, there's possible revenue options there. It doesn't, from people I've talked to so far this weekend, doesn't seem like a lot for a small game. Um, but then there's also the exposure element. So can you talk about the, I mean, it's not really trade-offs. You get both of those things potentially. But which one you see for small developers having more value and how much in particular that, well, if you have any you know, general revenue numbers that a small game might, might be seeing now and also what the exposure that you've seen for, game, for small games is like being in a being in an arcade. Yeah. 
Um, so we haven't uh, finalized uh, the uh, terms of revenues for uh, indie versus uh, big games, uh, both on the uh, regular monetary uh, distribution site like Byport uh, versus LBE. But something that we have seen is that because the uh, discovery system is easier for, uh, say, a springboard um, or an omnivert, uh, looking through, it's easier to find content. Uh, so for that, if a uh, operator does add in a, uh, say, uh, your game, it's very uh, positive. So we've seen actually a lot of indie developers um, have a lot of exposure from different locations, especially if their, uh, if their actual consumer version is relatively low cost. So we saw uh, for the consumer versions, the ones that are 30 plus don't have the widespread uh, uh, distribution at venues from Springboard since, or even um, a lot of the other ones like uh, Steam has one as well and Omnivert. Um, those are more expensive for the operators to uh, rent per seat, per day, per minute. Um, and then a lot of the content that we're seeing that is widespread is actually free. So think of uh, the lab um, from Valve. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the lower cost the, uh, the game is, we see it more widespread. But that's also not the uh, best uh, statistic as well as far as a, a game developer. If you make your game cheaper, it's more widespread for venue operators. So there's a lot to be figured out. There's a lot of costs for a lot of different uh, components for that side, both uh, the operator and the, the developer. Um, yes. Uh, something that I would like to add there is because location-based entertainment content does not have to be very complicated and does not have to be very expansive. It does not have to be very long. You can make something very short, very pretty, easy mechanics for not that much. And then if you work with companies like Viveport or Springboard, you can get immediate distribution and get immediate return on your, some return on your investment by the pay per play model. So for example, I think Springboard says that they have 350 VR arcades and they give about 3,000 demos a month, something like that. And each um, content studio takes home three to four cents per minute that people play. So if somebody's playing your game for one hour a day in all 300 locations, that's, that's money that you get every month. So n less uh, investment on making simpler content and then d you have set distribution channels. And when you think of something like the lab, for example, it's very basic and uh, yeah. visual. It's a very simple game of mechanic. You can pick it up a couple of times, and that's something that you can play over and over and over and yeah. over and over again. Yeah. I mean, I'm still playing it, like, what, <laughs> four years later or whatever. Yeah. But. Yeah. And I also think there's tremendous opportunity. As we were saying, it's really, really hard to find uh, content that is not a first-person shooter, that is family-friendly, mm -hmm. that we want to curate such a library to operators around the world. So it, there, there is a plenty of uh, open spots for developers to think about those simple, family-friendly, fun, social activities that are easy and cheaper to make than a much bigger, deeper game. Uh, and we'll, we're always happy to partner with these developers and pushing them for, for, on, at the forefront to, to operators all around the world. So, so the opportunity is open. Please jump in. And, and we're, we're looking for content, yes. so <laughs> bring it on. Yes, please. Bring content. Yes, please. Please. Uh, there's been a lot of, you know, when you're talking about uh, the competitive nature and competitive play on, uh, on location, uh, a lot of the conversation talks about having a lot of parallel play. When you're doing tournament mode, you can see the other people that you're playing with. Um, but has there ever been any consideration to non-parallel uh, competitive play. And I'll give an example. Um, I personally am in uh, pinball leagues. Uh, and, and we do, we organize, you know, every, every on certain days we go and we play together and we actually keep a running tally throughout our season. Uh, but there are people that are not able to uh, meet together uh, in order to do, be a part of those tournaments. So what we, we do is we self-organize into what we call selfie league. So we go to a location and we basically play king of the hill with our top scores, taking selfies with our score for that, you know, in trying to top whatever is the current ranking high score before a certain deadline. 
Um, is that is something that would be feasible for, like, say, uh, uh, an LBE or you know, like a, a family entertainment center? To, yes, to yes, sanction I would say and organize, yes. Uh, even for those games that don't accommodate tournament, you know, parallel tournament tournament play. Especially in in, in our environment, there's there's oftentimes player that come to to the station with by themselves. You know, people do go to casinos or other other location-based venues and they don't know anybody and they want to play and, and absolutely yeah we're looking for content that can be played together but also good content that can be where you can compete and like you said you can compete asynchronously where you're you're competing in different location at uh, on the same leaderboard so I actually have a really interesting um, tournament software that I just started talking to about a month ago called Swift Tech Interactive I don't know if they're for base out of the, I think Iceland or Nor some Nordic country, um, and the way that they do tournaments is really really different. And they have like let's say these different booths are all VR stations, and there's a line of people here, and you actually each each booth has a one minute one to two minute gameplay that's really simple mechanics like shooting an arrow, throwing a ball, and then immediately you get out and you go in the next booth, and then that person goes in, and then it goes like that as a chain, and then at the end there's a leaderboard. So they never actually see the other person playing. And and you get to play at the end five minutes of gameplay, but during the entire time, there's a group of people cheering people on. No, he's got. Oh, he's gonna win. There's this interactive point, and then there's also the all the different types of games that you get to play. And then again, you don't see the other people in the experience. Um, I thought it was very unique. I'd never seen anything like it. And yeah, we're currently testing it, and it's pretty fun at the shop. <laughs> I, I haven't had access to a clock. I don't know how we're doing in time. Probably we do need to wrap. Any last thoughts to share before we wrap? Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, look forward to talking to more of you.